for a sustainable society. It can be used to replace fossil-based products. Lignocyte is a unique test bed in the world. We can produce uh, lignin from uh, different uh, black liquors that is, comes from different paper mills and uh, we can scale it up from uh, only a few grams up to tons. Lignin in one sentence is the glue in wood, but you can extract it uh, in the process we do here in Ligna City. And instead of burning it in the paper mill, we can uh, create a higher value with uh, evaluating the lignin into uh, different products. It can be in asphalt, it can be made carbon fiber out of it, and it can be made bioplastic and many other applications. Uh, the test bed is located uh, as a neighbor to Nordic paper where the black liquor come from, that we uh, produce lignin out of. Within the testbed Lignin City, you also get contact with the, the research institute RISE. We can help companies that are interested in the lignin value chains, from the raw material lignin to the end products. So here at RISE we have resources to work on the lignin that produce in Lignin City. The, we work on the different applications such as uh, thermoplastics, thermosets, chemicals and fuels from lignin. So in this lab we make lignin based carbon fiber and use it in different applications. For example in this car you can see the roof is a lignin based carbon fiber composite that the carbon fiber were made here in this lab. Also this car has a lithium ion battery that in this battery also we use the lignin based carbon fibers. In Ligna City, we want to uh, welcome uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises uh, that we can help to take the leap from idea to market in small and safe steps, which reduces uh, the risk to scale up. Our time here at RICE was, was a key in our development. It helped us to have our product ready for the market, and now we are moving on and, and starting our demo plant unit outside Stockholm, where we will produce 2,000 tons per year of our material right now. This is one of the end application of what we do at Rencom, using lignin to make plastic bags. And the name of it is Renol, and we can mix it with bioplastics or fossil-based plastics, depending on the applications you want to do with it. Region Värmland is strong in bioeconomy, partly because we have a lot of forests here and uh, skills in how to uh, create different applications out of the wood, but we want to grow even better and bigger on the bioeconomy and lignin is one track. Here we have space for new possibilities with conference room, facilities and the laboratory. Welcome everyone to Ligna City's webinar of today. Hope you could enjoy the film. And if you want to see it again, you can find it on the Ligna City webpage and also directly on YouTube. Today we are presenting two very interesting speakers. It's Pete Pitk from Granul in Estonia and also Jeff Bell from Microbiogen in Australia. And very welcome to all our visitors and also to our speakers. Uh, for the best impression of today, um, we recommend you to use the speaker's view and you can choose uh, yourself in your upper right corner of the screen, the different options, uh, how you can see us on the screen. And we also make you aware of that we are recording the event and the recordings uh, will also be found later on on the Ligna City webpage. Uh, I am Maria Olmholt, working on the test bed Ligna City as project manager and also with business development. And uh, these webinars that we send is a collaboration thanks to projects that we run. Uh, now we are in a project called Ligna Innovation and uh, it is financed by the Structural EU Fund and the Region Värmland and also the partners, uh, Paper Province, Rice and uh, the municipality of Kristinehamn. So thanks, thanks to all the partners. 
And we plan to do more webinars. So if you have good ideas who you would like to listen to in the, one of them, uh, please let us know. And uh, if you have any questions today to the speakers, uh, please type them in the chat uh, and uh, you can find it on uh, the bottom of your screen. Uh, so just press on the chat and then you can type a message there. So I hope we have a peep uh, with us uh, and uh, with the camera on and the sound on. Welcome. Yes, hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Good. Welcome. And uh, yes, your presentation is coming up. And uh, there you go. And I hope you first start with presenta presenting yourself also. And then we will look forward to listen to you and uh, see what questions come up afterwards. So please, Peep, go on. Yes. So uh, good meet day. To everybody from my side also and thanks for the Ligna City and Maria for uh, inviting us to uh, give a status update of our uh, developments with the wood fractionation plant industrial scale up in Estonia. So uh, yes my name is Per Pitt, I'm R&D manager of Granal Biotech and uh, I will give you a short overview of the progress uh, during the last five years uh, with this concept development and what is our timeline uh, for the scale up and uh, what is the status with the availability of the samples and process optimizations we have gone through in the meanwhile so but uh, in the beginning everything starts from somewhere and uh, we as a granite biotech are a spin-off company from granite group and Granite Group is almost 20 years old, uh, started in 2003 and in 18 years has developed into European leading pellet producer. And along that, uh, it's also present in, uh, in the whole value chain of the forest management, production of uh, bioenergy, obviously wood pellets and, uh, and also on the logistics side. And uh, it was in 2016, when the uh, conscious decision was made that, okay, now, let it, now it's time uh, to build on the experience and the knowledge that has been gained in the mechanical processing side and uh, start looking into biochemicals and biomaterials. So like I said, 2016 decision, uh, in one and a half year, uh, we uh, submitted the uh, BBI JU flagship proposal called Sweetwoods and uh, it got approved in the end of 2017 and in quarter two, two, 2018 it all uh, started for us. But what, uh, what the wood fractionation for us in general is all about. So when we started uh, looking into the field, uh, selecting the technologies, doing due diligence, uh, testing different pre-treatment platforms, then what we wanted to achieve is that uh, to turn it a bit around. So conventional solutions target either sugars for ethanol, uh, they target cellulose, but everything else is uh, rather used as a, as a side product or mainly for the energy purposes. We wanted to find the bread treatment that allows us to really go with the maximum rate of wood into the bioproducts for bio biochemicals and biomaterials. And after a one and a half year of uh, very intensive work, uh, we found the solution for us. But before I go into the details, then uh, the Sweetwoods, the flagship uh, around what we are, we are currently uh, uh, scaling up the uh, wood fractionation plant. Uh, it's a BBI flagship uh, project. Uh, Crown of Biotech is putting the steel on the ground. And then we have uh, on the downstream of the value chain for the sugars, uh, Global BioNetch is validating our sugars and uh, optimizing their process on it. And then on the lignin side, we have the Technaro Rectisel Armacell as an industrial partners uh, testing our lignin fractions uh, in their formulations and recipes. So uh, also Metchen is on board and uh, Metchen uh, is validating their enzymatic solution on our hydrolysates and also lignin depolymerization and sugar polymerization. So uh, the Sweetwoods and the BBI JU funding is uh, not just nice to have funding, but for us, uh, in the end, it was also external validation that the process and the concept that we are seeing ourselves as a 
as a green light way to go. It uh, was also externally validated by different experts and uh, we're highly grateful for that. And also uh, what we are really uh, highly appreciated also the second flagship that we are not the leaders, but consortium partners that is built up on the sweet boots. Uh, and our lignin is that we are bond to uh, to take the hydrolysis lignin and to convert it into the uh, lignin based the uh, presence. So, about the timeline, so Sweetwood's uh, proposal and the funding didn't mean that uh, that was the goal, that was the beginning of the hard work. And in the beginning, we understood that uh, it's first of a kind, uh, and we want to separate the investment into two phases. First, validate that the industrial scale, the bread treatment, and then uh, build based on that the downstream part. So uh, quarter four, 2020, we uh, commissioned the uh, uh, fractionation part of the bread treatment part. Uh, and based on this success, we uh, made the investment decision into phase two. And the phase two means everything after the bread treatment. So hydrolysis, separation, solid liquid separations, evaporation, drying, etc. So we are currently in the middle of construction. Uh, quarter four 2020 is targeted mechanical ready in the start of commissioning. And 2023 for us is a first industrial production ramp up year. So picture definitely tells more than, uh, than my words. So uh, to exemplify what the phase one meant. So it was mainly the pre-treatment line along the side with the pilot unit and few tanks where we can put the whole slurry uh, coming from the pre-treatment. So that's how it looks inside. Uh, industrial uh, pre-treatment line with uh, yeah, with 25 cubes uh, at design capacity of the OSRI coming out at 15% uh, solids. And then uh, alongside with that, we built the pilot line that is 15 cubic meter hydrolysis and all the industry relevant scale separation, uh, drying and also uh, evaporation uh, technologies at site to optimize uh, the process steps and also to produce uh, samples at scale. So this is now uh, the uh, current status at site with the phase two uh, being in the middle way. So uh, you see there is way more tanks now uh, almost ready than uh, the three in the phase one. Uh, the evaporators are in place, the key equipment also in the solid uh, liquid separation part in place. And early next year starts all the piping ele electrical cabling uh, works uh, to be ready quarter three, quarter four next year for a uh, uh, sequential startup and commission. And this is the uh, model that, uh, that we are moving towards uh, end of next year. So what uh, this uh, value chain for us means, or uh, we are concentrating on the upstream. So obviously it all starts in the forestry. What we have defined for us is that the, uh, the wood species that we focus on currently is birch. And uh, so it's certified forest uh, resource efficient logistics and harvesting uh, managing practices. Then it's a wood processing into the plywood and from the plywood industry, the residual part, the chips will come into our plant. So with the demo plant, uh, we have enough chips available to be based solely on that, but obviously in the end, it uh, also needs to use the lower quality round food uh, to scale it up into the further industrial scale. So the core innovation uh, and the novelty is the bread treatment. So it's based on the sweet water energy license. Uh, it's called the sunburst fractionation process. In principle, it's uh, uh quite straightforward so the wood chips are going in there are different zones in between screw extrusion feeding grinding and then the reaction zone and uh, in 20 seconds basically the sawdust is turned into the whole slurry that you see in the picture here uh, and basically we call it the chocolate mousse so uh it really looks like it, it really feels like it, it uh, because the uh, particle size in this slurry is on average 50 to 60 microns. 
So uh, where we all, where we started in 2018 when we had this, uh, uh, let's say, build up and commissioning of the first phase was that we had this whole salary from the bread treatment and then uh, all the mass is going to enzymatic hydrolysis. Uh, after hydrolysis, it's a solid liquid separation and then we have the mixed sugars and um, crude lignin. So we call our lignin uh, trade, by trademark Lignova. But then uh, very soon when we started operating our pilot line, we understood that, uh, okay, this uh, it's a viable option, but not the best one. And we separated the uh, processing into two, two parts. So uh, first, uh, from the host slurry, separating the hemicellulose derived C5 sugars, and then lignos, lignocellulosic cake, uh, the solid part uh, further directed into the enzymatic hydrolysis. And after hydrolysis, having the C6 sugars, plus a bit uh, better quality and higher purity uh, lignin. But that's not it. So we, we have the pilot line up and running. Uh, we have a dedicated team there. And uh, at a certain point, we got with this uh, C5, C6 concept into the point that it was already fine tuning. And then uh, we started looking into the alternatives. And the alternative is that taking the lignocellulose cake and I, instead of enzymatic hydrolysis going into the uh, lignin solubilization in high alkali conditions. And with that, uh, we get the lignin in a solution and uh, we are able to extract the microcrystalline cellulose. So uh, it's a unique kind of a material. Uh, here it's shown the three grades, the good one the, uh, and the two bleach steps. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of uh, color of nature, but in the end, it's a question that does it always need to be white? And then with the solubilized lignin, obviously the straightforward version is to go into the precipitation and to, uh, to get the lignin out as a, as a precipitated uh, powder. And uh, other option is to have the solu solution and to concentrate it up. But obviously at certain, with the concentrate, you have some limits on the evaporation and concentration. So there will be a lot of water in the, uh, in the product. And that's my first, uh, let's say, question to the audience or the uh, ask for uh, help and new ideas. So we have this uh, unique LCC material, lignocellulosic cake, with a very uh, small particle size. Uh, and the question is, uh, if there are any interesting concepts to be validated, how to valorize it further, further or how to extract the cellulose or uh, lignin out of it. And we are definitely interested to hear you out and uh, to test the processes concept at our site. So now turning into the products, uh, first uh, shortly about the sugars and microcrystalline cellulose uh, and then to the lignin. So if we talk about the sugars, then uh, as we do the bread treatment in a very short time, it means that uh, we can very well control the severity and uh, it ends up in a high quality sugars. It's low inhibitors, HMF4 for our very low levels. So from the uh, hard wood, uh, what we get into the sugars is the acetic acid, but I would say that also acetic acid is quite low levels. And the C5 uh, hemicellulose derived sugars currently is more suitable for the, uh, let's say biofuels fermentations, but the C6 quality already is a quite uh, near to the direct drop-in for dextrose uh, replacement. So a bit more optimization from our side and a bit more adaption of the uh, box from the bioprocess developer side. And I think we have quite soon match for one one uh, replacement. And important, we have it already from our pilot uh, production available at ton scale as industrial representative samples. So microcrystalline cellulose, we call it crude, blonde, and white. It's a native cellulose one type. Concentration or the total solids in this base is 10 to 20%. So currently we are focusing on the pastes. Uh, we are looking also on the drying options to get it powdered uh, and dried. But uh, if you want to have a more details about this material, then just uh, write us, give us a call, and we can have a way more uh, longer discussion with the more expert people uh, on board. 
but the difference in the end is in the content of the lignin in the samples. And again, important to emphasize that we have these fractions all available at uh, 100 kilogram scale from our pilot line. Lignin. So uh, I think if you look at the lignin, then uh, most it looks looks the same, but it's the same, same, but different in the end. So our lignova fractions, main characteristics, uh, as we define it, it's a near native structure. So in the bread treatment, we don't chemically modify it. It doesn't smell. So as it's not chemically modified, then it's, uh, the, it doesn't have any distinct, distinct smell beside the wood smell itself. Uh, what we have available is different uh, moisture contents. So obviously if you filter press it and separate, then you have it 45% uh, moisture lignin cake, but with the ring dryer, we are applying on the industrial scale, we can get it to the three to 15% range. Uh, we can uh, get different particle size fractions of the dry powder, starting with the heterogeneous mass of 10 to 10 microns to one millimeter particle size. But uh, with the defined grinding technologies, we can go uh, and target also below 100 micron. And we have also option to go below 20 micron powder. But obviously, the smaller powder, the drier it is, the more explosive uh, the material is, the more problematic the handling. And again, available at ton scale. So looking back where we started uh, in 2017, 2018, the hydrolysis lignin uh, we had, uh, had a lignin content below 80%, uh, still some uh, quite some uh, carbohydrates inside as a monomeric polymeric form. And in the time and in the optimization of our pilot line, so we have the Lignova crude, uh, now at roughly at 90% lignin inside of the total solids and the Lignova Pure, we are targeting 95. So uh, these are, in my view and understanding, uh, one of the best quality hydrolysis lignin available uh, on the market. So uh, Lignin molecular weight and the characterization of the lignin, I think it's a topic of its own. So uh, to get the representative numbers between different uh, measurement technologies and between different labs is quite complicated. So what I want to show here is just uh, we use the same methodology uh, to compare uh, the uh, commercial available graft, our Lignova crude and Lignova pure. And if you look at the curves, then uh, there is uh, some big differences, um, but uh, mainly the difference comes from the average molecular weight. So the crude is the most uh, dispersed one uh, and the with the highest molecular weight average one, but the Lignova Pure is something in between the craft and the uh, crude one. So the Pure is kind of a first step refined lignin for us. And uh, this is definitely not where we stop. So uh, uh, how we see our Lignova is that it's a very good starting point for further modifications and uh, let's say the valorization of the lignin uh, to more specific uh, intermediates. So what we do like described is the solubilization of the lignin in the alkali. And then uh, one option is to do direct membrane fractionation. Together with the metion, we are evaluating the enzymatic depolymerization combined with the membrane separation. And obviously, like I said before, we are open for new ideas. Uh, we have quite some uh, capacity to test things at site. So we are open for testing, discussing, and seeing how this uh, different process concepts work on our uh, lignin material. And just a quick uh, glimpse into the molecular weight with the same kind of methodology <laughs> with the two two membrane cutouts, uh, you can separate very well the or fraction eight, the molecular weight uh, uh, or separate the smaller and the higher molecular weight fractions and uh, they have totally different behavior in, uh, in the viscosity viewpoint in alkali solutions, but also the thermoplastic behavior, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a kind of a starting point for further uh, fractionation. What I want to highlight what we have learned in the in the process is the what is important about the lignin. So there are very many different lignin uh, fractions proposed on the market to be tested out that have very good performance. But in the end, uh, 
from the kilogram sample scale to the industrial supply, there are very many different aspects that need to be followed. And uh, these are things that we have now in place. So the technology of the drying, what is the morphology of the dried materials, moisture content ranges, uh, attex characteristics of the uh, grinded material, pre-grinded material, what is the particle size dispersions, the density of the material, flowability, dustiness, storing conditions, stability during uh, storing, transport requirements, uh, temperature requirements during transport, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very long list of uh, things that you need to be uh, checked before any industrial term discussions could be, uh, could be on the table. And uh, so this is just to show you a bit uh, different angle, uh, what kind of pilot line we have. So 15 cubic meter hydrolysis, different smaller tanks, uh, solid liquid separations, decanter filter presses, uh, uh, evaporators that uh, allows us to concentrate the sugars, uh, lignin solubilization equipment, mixing equipment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we can do things at scale. And one last topic that I want to stop on is the uh, life cycle assessment uh, of these concepts. and. Uh, how we see that we want to move further with that. So there are two options. So you can uh, count the biogenic carbon from the cradle to gate uh, version, but uh, we see that the most apple to apple comparison in the end is that uh, if we do the uh, carbon neutral approach, means that we just count the uh, CO2 footprint of the whole value chain that you're putting in. So the harvesting in the forest, the logistics, the, opera, the processing itself, and then you compare apples to apples. But if, if we take in the biogenic part and then uh, don't count what is take or don't care what is happening with the material later on, then uh, it's a very diverse field and very hard to, hard to compare the numbers uh, for the end users. And with that, I would like to finish. So I really uh, invite people to uh, take a contact with us and uh, let's, let's discuss what can be done together, either with your process or uh, with our materials in your process. So um, thanks again for the uh, possibility to uh, give a quick intro to what we do. Thanks, Pip, for giving us this interesting presentation. Uh, very good to listen to you. And I'm interested to hear what, what's your vision for the next, let's say, five years? So as soon as this one is up and running and the last uh, small question marks answers uh, to ourselves, so about the, uh, let's say, 24-7 operations and how much wear and tear and uh, downtime we should expect, then in uh, 2023, we want to definitely look into the larger uh, industrial scale uh, scale up. So uh, currently it's one line, then it could be four to six lines of the bread treatments in the same uh, unit. And then we start more detail looking into the locations and the strategic partners for the either sugar sling or MCC and uh, building up the case studies uh, to make it happen in 2020. For 2025 perspective, at least with the investment decision. So. Great. And the best uh, way to follow your uh, news in the future is it during your web page? You're using social media. What do you recommend? Yeah, it's uh, currently it's a Sweetwoods uh, platform that where uh, most recent updates are. But uh, soon we will have some news about it uh, where you can follow us. Great, thank you. We will welcome our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Jeff from Australia. Uh, what time is it for you at the moment? Uh, it's uh, half past 12 in the morning. So good, good morning or good evening to afternoon to everybody. Yeah, and I think we have uh, listeners or viewers from all around the world, from all continents, actually, which is really cool, I think, that we can get there in this digital way. So, uh, excellent. And uh, Jeff, tell us about yourself and uh, share your presentation, and uh, we will listen carefully what you are telling us. All right. Thanks very much, Marie. Let me share my screen. Yes. 
See if I can get this right. I think that we're there. Is that looking good? That's looking good. Very well. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Thanks, Marie. Um, so, look, I apologise up front for the Australian accent. So, if I, I will try to speak a little slower, so maybe you can understand me. Um, I hope that's not too much of a problem. So, what I want to talk tonight about is, oh, well, this afternoon for you is uh, alternative sustainable carbon sources as substitutes for metal metallurgical coal. But before I do that, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what we do at Microbiogen. Uh, most people you may not have even heard of us. Um, we're an industrial biotech company. We were formed in 2001, so we've been around for 20 years. We've been building a platform technology based on Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast, and that's all we do. Um, and what we've done is we've developed it so it can, it can do a lot more than it used to and a lot better than it used to. Um, we've partnered, I guess, what's relevant for this discussion in the biofuels area, we've partnered with Novozymes. Uh, and when you see the Novozymes product um, for biofuels, those are actually microbiogen developed products, either 100% developed by microbiogen or developed in partnership with them, depending whether it's a GM or non-GM solution. Um, other partnerships we've done with Novozymes, we, we've just completed a, a three-year, $8 million project optimizing the world's uh, best second-generation biofuel um, biocatalyst, and we've made it not just stronger and acid-resistant, but for the first time ever, the one biocatalyst not only produces the ethanol and the fuels, but grows on its own waste stream. And that's really important because it means you can use, and we did our particular program based on the gas, but you could use wood as well. But for the first time, biofuels will actually add to the food supply rather than um, taking away from it. And that's taking non-food biomass in the first instance. So that um, you can download all those reports from our website there. I've got them on the screen at www.microbiogen.com under the news section. But just to give you some idea, we, if you compare our new biocatalyst versus the state-of-the-art second-generation biocatalyst, um, we've had a peer-reviewed um, LCA analysis completed, and, and they suggested that it would reduce carbon emissions by an additional 29% um, consumptive water use by 75%, and most interesting, England, most interestingly, land use by 240%. What it means is for every hectare of sugarcane that you convert to biofuels, you will actually require 2.4 more hectares less land because you're producing so much fuel from, from the waste materials. So we're very, very happy with those outcomes. That was funded by the Australian government. And if anyone wants to know about that, you talk to Novozymes, they're our partners. Um, moving on. Um, so when we did our our um, second generation projects, we were having to produce lots of hydrolysis because in, in our Australian development programs, we needed the C5 and the C6 liquor streams to um, test our, our yeast in. Now, when we did that, of course, we ended up with all this lignin we were producing and we used the uh, NREL dilute acid pretreatment technology. And we were turning up all this lignin. And so we ended up partnering with the Smart Centre at the University of New South Wales. Um, and a little bit of background about them is this is a group headed up by Professor Veena Sahawala. I don't know if you know her, but she's actually quite a successful engineer in Australia and, and runs a, a, quite a department there. And they've commercialised what's called a polymer injection technology. This takes rubber tyres, old rubber tyres, and treats them so that you can use them in conjunction with metallurgical coal to produce steel in an electric arc furnace. And this is now being commercialized around the world. And so far, their technology is being used in over 84,000 heats around the world and over 2.4 million recycled tires have been used. So they really know what they're doing. And in fact, what I'm gonna be talking about here today is pretty much their results based on the lignin we produced in our labs. So. I'm actually a geologist, geophysicist by training. So hopefully nobody asks me too many difficult questions about steel making because the rest of this really sort of goes into looking at the lignin that we produce in our process and how it might work as a replacement for metallurgical coal. 
So why would we look at using lignin for metallurgical coal? Well, you can see in the chart here that um, coal is the biggest uh, CO2 emitter in the world. And in fact, a large part of that coal use is for metallurgical coal. Um, around 27% of, um, of CO2 emissions comes from iron and steel in the manufacturing sector and over 1 billion tonnes of met coal is used per year. So. If we could replace some of that with lignin, then that might be an opportunity. The other reason we're looking at lignin is when you look at um, biorefineries, um, it's very important for two things. One, all the biomass material comes in needs to be converted and valorized. And also you wanna get the maximum value for whatever unit of uh, biomass is coming in. And if you look historically, metallurgical coal typically sells around double the value of thermal coal. So if you could use lignin for something else other than burning it, and obviously there's a lot of things you can do, but we're looking at metallurgical coal, then it could make quite a difference to the, uh, the economics of a second generation biorefinery. Um, and I guess um, we're going to talk a little bit about steel making, but there are four main types which I've put here, but we'll go through those uh, in, in a minute. So the opportunity I was talking about, um, it's not just cost, um, but like all things, metallurgical coal is in limited supply. The high quality coal is being depleted. And so even the industry itself, apart from CO2 emissions, is looking for alternatives because of scarcity and because of, of uh, regulations. So um, the, the, the smart centre people at the University of New South Wales recognised that if you're going to come up with an alternative for met coal, it's got to have a couple of things. One is you can't, if you completely change the process, it's going to have a big capital cost and therefore may not be deployed. And secondly, while you want to reduce the carbon footprint, you can't have it affecting your process too badly. So what they did, the whole idea of this process was to look at various different substrates and what they could, whether they could be used in steel manufacturing or not. And one of those was lignin. So for those that don't know steel making, and I'm presuming most of you don't know too much, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about steel making. I mean, steel is used in a whole wide range of areas, you know, steel cans, cars, everyone knows that it's very, very widely used. I won't go into any more detail there. But there are different types of steels. Um, for example, cast iron is a high carbon steel, whereas stainless steel contains high levels of chromium. You can see 18% chromium and 8% nickel. But all of them, none of them, have very high levels of oxygen because that's what you don't want in your steel. So you need a process where the iron oxide, which is the iron ore, is converted into iron uh, metal. Again, just a little bit of, this is a typical iron and steel making process. You start with iron ore, coal, you add limer into a sinter plant or coke ovens, goes into a blast furnace or an electric arc furnace, and you end up making molten steel. And there are mini, mini mills around that recycle, et cetera. So there are a few different technologies. The main one we'll be looking at here will be blast furnace, which is the most common type uh, um, steel making process. So the first step, there's two steps if you're going to use a carbon source, whether it's for, to turn it for, for coal to turn into a met coal. The first is you need to produce coke. That is, you take the, uh, the metallurgical coal and you put it into an oxygen-free environment and heat it up and um, get rid of all the volatiles, which is what you need to do. So your first step is to turn metallurgical coal into coke. The second, and, and, and sorry, that coke then has three really important roles in it. There's a physical role. It needs to hold up the iron ore. The iron ore and the coke needs to sit in a big blast furnace so the air can get through and the heat can be done. It's a chemical role because it's reducing the iron oxide to iron metal. And there's a thermal role, and that is the coke also generates heat to allow the steel making process to happen. So this program, what they, the Smart Center did is they took three different sort of potential sources of um, replacement for metallurgic coal. One was waste CDs, and everyone knows there's a lot of waste CDs in the world, but apparently it's a bit of a problem for landfill because everyone's 
you know, <laughs> we're using Netflix these days rather than CDs. And so you can see CDs have dropped off. The, the only problem with CDs is while there have been a lot produced, the total estimated tonnage of CDs is about 800,000 tonnes, which only represents 0.01% of one year's consumption of metallurgical coal. So this would be a good idea to get rid of waste, but it's not going to make a really big difference to the metallurgical coal industry. Another one this company looked at is macadamia nuts. Macadamia nuts are great, um, and we produce a lot in Australia, and the industry has about 375,000 tonnes per year of actual waste that they're looking for things to do with. And again, you could get rid of that waste. It's not going to make a big difference to the metallurgical industry, but the smart centre thought it was worth a look. And the final one is lignin from 2G bioethanol plants. And if you do some back of the envelope calculations, you know, if ever they built out this, this these particular plants and you used all the lignin to replace met coal, then you'd have to replace about 10% of gasoline to get 230 million tonnes. The 230 million tonnes is a significant amount and would make a real, a real difference to the industry. So lignin is the opposite of the others. It's, it's an industry that's yet to build out, but it has potential to make a, a difference into the future. So looking at the four different Opportunities. So the first thing we look at is met coal, which has a very high uh, solid carbon weight. It's got also a very high ash content. And you compare that to the waste CDs where it's got a relatively low solid carbon, but it's a high total carbon. Macadamia nutshells, again, relatively, you know, 50% total carbon, but relatively low solid carbon. And lignin, 20% solid carbon and total 40%. The, according to the smart center people, they said that's still okay for um, the amount of carbon you require for metallurgical coal. Two sets of trials were carried out. As I said, to, to, to make metallurgical coal, you need the first step, you need to take away the volatiles, which is to make coke. And the second step is to actually use it to reduce the iron oxide to iron metal. So the first test I'm going to show you was the thermal degradation of the materials. And the second one is how it performed as reducing the reducing agent to produce the metal itself. So here, and look, I'm going through these fairly quickly. I'm sure this uh, presentation will be available. Um, and there's a whole big report that you can download at the end if you really want to look at the details. So I'm just going through reasonably quickly to show you some of the outcomes. So each of the materials were tested and each of the materials were found to be suitable. That is, you could convert them from their raw material state to a coke state. And you can see a waste CD, you required about 550 degrees for it to be converted from CD to a coke type material. Macadamia nuts, the temperature was lowered about three to 400 degrees. And lignin also, the range was 200 to 400 degrees before the volatiles were, were essentially flashed off to make the coke material. So all of them did pass that particular test. Yes, you could make them into a coke material. Then how did these perform in terms of, that is the coke material from the waste CD, how did it perform in reducing um, the iron oxide to the metal? And you can see these two charts here. See my mouse here. This is what, this is an X-ray diffraction spectrometer that shows you that the original iron oxide material had lots of different oxides in it. But after the um, actual uh, test, you can see that in fact, there was only iron metal. So it was actually quite successful. So the hematite was reduced at 1400 degrees C to iron metal, and it had a 100% conversion. So it was quite a successful test. In terms of macadamia nut shells, they carried out various different temperature tests and they tested over different periods of time. Down the bottom here is the untreated iron oxide. You can see all these peaks are oxides and you can see as you went through from untreated to three minutes to eight minutes at the top, you can see that basically all the uh, iron oxide was converted to iron metal um, and it was reasonably, um, reasonably successful. And then finally, uh, lignin. And what we're looking at here is this was the lignin actually mixed with um, iron oxide. And then it was put into a furnace at different temperatures at 1300, 1400, 1500, and 1600. 
And what you can see is at the lower temperature, what was what's called a sponge iron was produced. That is, that's just a spongy iron and all the carbon is retained within the metal. And then as the temperature goes up, the, the, the carbon is, uh, ex, uh, is expelled from the metal and you can see that you end up at 1600 degrees with pretty much a pure iron uh, material. It's not sponge at all. But what's nice about this material is this is the material you like to use in blast furnaces. So again, the tests show that in fact, lignin doesn't make a bad metallurgical cop. Um, and this is the some of the specific data that went through. So at the different temperatures, you can see the time it takes. So when you're putting your iron oxide and uh, metallurgical coal into a um, blast furnace, what you want to be doing is looking at how much carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide is released. Because once they stop being released, that means that you've reached your iron metal here. And you can see the higher the temperature, the faster it happens. So it only takes about six minutes at 1600 degrees, but more like 15 minutes at 1300 degrees. And the Smart Center said that this was actually reasonably typical of what you would find in the world today in, in iron manufacturing facilities. So the conclusion so far, look, it, on this particular program that the Smart Center did is all these um, materials could be made into suitable substitutes for metallurgical coal. To really make a difference though, it, lignin would present the greatest opportunity because of the potential future volumes. Um, and also it, it can make a, more of a difference potentially to the value of the, uh, the lignin in the plant. They all got reasonable yields of solid um, materials. Um, and some of in, in the material we supplied, which was the NREL dilute acid pretreatment, some of the, the um, impurities are actually beneficial in the um, steel making process. Um, so overall, pretty successful testing. And um, we then ran some basic numbers um, to say that, look, if you could, uh, instead of just burning the lignin in your 2G plant, you actually uh, were able to sell it as a, um, a metallurgical coal replacement and receive the typical price for metallurgical coal, then your revenues could increase by something around 10%, um, which, is, which is actually pretty attractive. Um, so look, that's it from me. Um, as I said, there is a full report that can be um, downloaded. I'm happy to send it uh, to anyone if they would like to see it. So I'll open it for questions. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, you, you excusing your accent, I need to pardon my, my, my Swedish accent then. Uh, I think we could follow, follow you perfectly well. Very interesting what you're doing. And uh, sponge iron was new to me. Yes. <laughs> now, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I think I've screwed something up, but am I still... Well, we can see uh, a planet, I think, or something from the universe. <laughs> ah, yeah, well, that's not the right thing, is it? <laughs> I, th I think you can just I'll stop, I'll stop sharing, stop sharing. Yeah. yeah exactly there you go, there, you go. Right. there we can see uh you instead uh so cool and and how is the interest in Australia for the bioeconomy and and lignin then in particular well it depends who you talk to um we're not the world's best country when it comes to our federal government they they well remember Australia is the world's largest exporter of coal so, and we are the world's largest exporter of gas. So the government's a little bit not too keen on some of this new age uh, CO2 reduction stuff. So they've kind of been um, dragging their feet, but the corporations and the states are pushing very hard. And, you know, for example, Australia is rolling out um, solar. I think right now the, 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 the hype is around electricity and hydrogen rather than bio. And so we, we're, we're needing to deal with that. But um, look, as I said, it, it, it depends who you talk to about the support. But yeah, things are changing. And in fact, there's been a big change in the last couple of years. The general sentiment is changing. And, and even those holdout governments are going, well, maybe we better do something about this. So that's kind of good news. 
Yeah, good. And the focus on carbon dioxide, both uh, you mentioned it in your presentation and also PEEP, if uh, PEEP is uh, uh, with us as well, perhaps you want to comment, how is it in Estonia with the bioeconomy? I think Estonia in the uh, global terms uh, is not the too big player. So uh, we have limited uh, resource beside wood. Uh, with the wood industry, we have certain uh, historical uh, processes that are in place so uh, yeah we we are kind of the first of a kind also in the new wave of bioeconomy economy here good to hear that we struggle together then uh, evelyn you have raised your hand my colleague evelyn uh, welcome to you can uh, turn your camera on as well if, if you dare and and uh, unmute yourself unmuting myself Yes. Uh, my question is to Geoffrey. Uh, you made a last statement about uh, the impurities on lignin is actually good for uh, when you're doing the coke process. Uh, could you please elaborate the first? What do you call impurities, and um, how this can be beneficial? Okay, so I'm not an expert in steel manufacturing, but the, the, what the university people explained to me is that, that when you have some of these impurities, what happens when you go into a blast furnace, the impurities become like a froth that come to the top and they protect the, the top of the blast furnace from in, you know, air oxygen getting back into the system. So you actually don't want just pure carbon, you want something that forms a crust at the top of the, the blast furnace to stop oxygen getting into the system. Um, and apparently some of the, some of the, my, I can't tell you which ones, but some of the impurities in it, and, and I think even it might've been some of the sulfur actually was beneficial. But um, again, I, I, I'm not an expert in steel making, so I don't wanna say too much, um, but I do understand that yes, yeah, some impurities are a good thing. And if we have more questions, you can do like Evelyn did, raise your hand and uh, speak out because I don't have any more in the chat. Uh, so take the opportunity and also con contact us afterwards is also, of course, allowed. Uh, so I actually have a question for Pete. I, I was interested in his talk. Um, Pete, your C5 liquor stream, what, do you, what, what does that get turned into? You're on mute. Yeah, <laughs> Pete needs to unmute. Uh, sorry. No worries. Uh, the, the most straightforward way definitely is the second G ethanol uh, using the uh, dedicated yeasts uh, because there is still some fine tuning to do to improve the quality, but, uh, but at least that's the starting point. So also uh, all the other uh, uses where molasses are used as a base case scenario, it's a quite similar uh, materials. Thanks. And Peep, do you have a question for, for Jeff as well, in return? Well, I think we, we will have a later on a longer discussion, so it's uh, definitely there are points to discuss. Very good. And I'm so grateful that both of you took your time to, to present here today. And uh, as we said in the beginning, the recording will be available later on on our web page. And we can already mention that the last webinar this year will be the 2nd of uh, December, and uh, we will uh, be listening to a company from Germany, Aligno Pure. They have used lignin in bakeries and also in cosmetics, uh, so a different topic. And also we hopefully can present uh, our brand new digital tour from the Ligno City, so you can look into our factory and see for yourself what it looks like. Uh, so we hope we have it all in place by then. So if we have more questions, take the opportunity. And as we said, you can raise your hand if you like, or write it in the chat. Uh, and if not, we are happy for the positive response we have reached uh, so far. Thanks uh, again. And with that, we say bye for now.
and go for, go for breakfast, lunch, or sleep, wherever you are. Thank you so much for today. Thanks, um, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.